Every year, a band of highly motivated amateur adventurers heads for a special place on Earth, chosen because it is remote, exotic, primitive, and challenging. A perfect place for Land Rovers. I'm Bill Baker. Welcome to Land Rover Adventures. We're here in Hollister Hills, California, watching Camel Trophy U.S. Trials, where these people want to be part of the next Camel Trophy, Kalamatan 1996. They have to endure 30 straight hours of tough mental and physical challenges to earn a seat in a Land Rover Discovery so that they can travel a thousand miles across the island of Borneo. In the next hour, we're going to tell you about last year's Camel Trophy event, which began at U.S. Trials just like this. We'll also take a look at some exciting events in the rapidly growing world of Land Rover in North America. Thinking about your own adventure? Here's a good mix of intensive driving instruction and serious relaxation called the Land Rover Experience. In 1995, some lucky owners cleared their busy schedules to travel to points as far away as England to savor the Land Rover lifestyle. Combine lifestyle and adventure with competition, and you've got the world's toughest ski race, the Land Rover 24 Hours of Aspen. How about 80 runs down Aspen Mountain, with the only break coming on the gondola ride back up? Here's a group of athletes just as elite as the Camel Trophy teams, putting their considerable talents and skills to work for a very worthwhile cause. Go. For our first story, Let's go back about a year ago and take a look at the tale of the 1995 Camel Trophy team as they began the road to Mundo Maya 95 in a story we call The Ultimate Adventure Quest. The Camel Trophy adventure has been called many things, but no one has ever called it easy. Because it pits two-person teams from many different nations against each other and against some of the toughest physical, mental, and four-wheel driving challenges in the world, it's often called the Olympics of four-wheel drive. In 1987, a tough Colorado mountain man motorcycle racer named Tom Collins represented the United States when the Camel Trophy made the first north to south traverse of Madagascar. Camel Trophy is first and foremost about adventure. We go to the most exotic places on earth. We've been all over Africa, Asia, Indonesian archipelago, Siberia. You name the uh, far off place, Camel Trophy has uh, visited it. And we built Camel Trophy as a competitive adventure. Uh, the adventure part is 1,000 miles of 4x4 driving on some of the toughest roads that the world has to offer during the tropical rainy season. And the competitive aspect is a whole series of special tasks that take place at the beginning of the event and at the end. And they involve everything that would occur on an actual expedition put into a competitive form. As the grueling days go by, the trophy marshals carefully watch each contestant's performance, attitude, and willingness to help a fellow adventurer. Those characteristics are then voted on by all the teams as they select the Team Spirit winners. This is a highly cherished honor and an important measure of the success of the team effort. The ultimate recognition is the Camel Trophy itself a gold and silver sculpture that is valued at more than $40,000. The team that has the best average in the special tasks and the team spirit scoring 
wins the Camel Trophy. In many countries of the world, winning this event is on a par with winning the World Cup in skiing or soccer. Sponsored by worldwide brands, manufacturers of Camel Trophy adventure wear, and by Land Rover four-wheel drive vehicles, the adventure each year attracts as many as one and a half million applicants for the 40 slots available. No professional drivers or active military are allowed. There are no entry fees. Candidates are selected by their life experiences and by their performance in national selection trials held in each participating country. This is the story of how a U.S. Camel Trophy team is selected. The book cliffs of western Colorado in midwinter are a stark contrast to the conditions in which Camel Trophy participants usually find themselves in competition. This Bureau of Land Management property is set aside for four-wheel drive activities and is a perfect site for a weekend of grueling tests to determine which candidates will go on to the international selection trials. Twelve men and women have been chosen out of more than 1,600 applicants to have their stamina and perseverance tested to the limits as Tom Collins and his crew look for their final candidates. Well, the first thing I look at is to see what kind of physical condition the candidates are in. I need people that are athletic and that can hold up under a lot of stress and a lot of physical abuse for 18 days. So I, I want people that have done a lot of swimming and a lot of running, uh, who have competed in uh, sports in the last year. And then the next thing I look at are people who have a lot of experience in off-road driving and competitive driving. The other thing we look at is we're looking for intelligence. Camel Trophy is a thinking person's game. What will wind up being 30 non-stop hours of intense activity, huddling against the cold and fighting off fatigue, begins rather comfortably indoors, poring over topographical maps to find answers to a lengthy written test. Later, with their sights set on a spot on the Camel Trophy Mundo Maya 95 team, the dozen shivering candidates willingly dove into a frigid pool to prove they had the strength needed to someday cross a crocodile-inhabited lake. Our primary goal for the U.S. team is to have very good drivers who are good mechanics who get along with all the other teams. So we start off with mechanical training where they can actually get their hands on a Land Rover turbo diesel Discovery and take the vehicle apart and put it back together. It's one thing to run six miles at sea level. It is something else entirely to do it at an altitude of 5,000 feet with grades of 20 degrees or more. The six mile run quickly separated the truly dedicated athletes from those less prepared for the physical challenge. Then with the finish line in sight, the gasping candidates were hit with a gut-wrenching challenge. Come on, come on. Brute strength, it can be helpful, but if you're intelligent and you figure out how to solve the problem without brute strength, you're ahead of the game. In fact, if you look at the average size of the competitors from around the world, they're probably 5 feet 10 and 160 to 170 pounds. Uh, they're true athletes. You don't need the brute strength, but you need athletic ability and stamina. The four women contenders did not do well in this exercise. Did this mean they will not be able to complete the challenge? All right, all right, all right. They can do it. They need to have some upper body strength to be able to climb the ropes and to, uh, you know, do the mechanical work. But that doesn't take brute strength. We have three barrels that represent rocks across the river. And the river, we say, is either crocodile or piranha infested. And they're given a rope and a log and they have to figure out how to get all their people across those three islands to the other side of the river using just the tools that we provide. And once again, this one really tests their ingenuity. The last one we tried was great fun. We had uh, 
a vehicle and an anchor point, and we gave them a big long rope, uh, a lot of pulley blocks, picks, shovels, spare tires, and a lot of other gear, and said, well, you have to get the vehicle at the bottom of the hill to the top of the hill without using the, uh, the motor or the winch. They started using the extra gear at first, but then all of a sudden it came to their uh, attention that this wasn't necessary. It was just the ropes and the pulley blocks that were needed to get the job done. And it was very interesting to see how the people figured it out. This, this was a test of, uh, of thinking, ingenuity, and being efficient. After nine hours, their spirits were still high. Good job! I love doing things that are challenging, so this is this definitely qualifies. Yeah. Well, at first I just thought it'd be a lot of fun, you know, to come and try out. But now that I'm here, I'm seeing more and more um, of the things that the Camel Trophy is all about. You know, it's like bringing out the best in people, teamwork, hard work. You don't give up. You just keep going. Those are qualities that I've always wanted, like having myself. As the thin winter light faded to darkness, each of the contestants had their first turn at the wheel in a precision driving exercise. The turbo diesel Land Rover Discoveries are veterans of past Camel Trophy adventures and gave the competitors an idea of what these vehicles are all about. The judges watched carefully as each driver attempted to balance their discovery on a teeter-totter, a demonstration of clutch and throttle control. As the hours dragged on, each of the necessary skills needed to successfully complete a Camel Trophy adventure was brought into play. The night navigational challenge began at a time the contestants were beginning to feel the long hours of physical and mental stress. The object was to plot a course using a precise distance measuring device called a TerraTrip computer. The directions they were provided took them over rock-strewn gullies and steep, muddy slopes. As the mercury dropped, the steady rain turned to snow, but it could not dampen the enthusiasm the young men and women felt for the challenge. Critical winching technique was called into play. A lot of time is spent teaching winching safety, which is crucial when a 5,000 pound vehicle is suspended on a thin steel cable. At the 25th hour, one contestant had dropped out and two had all but thrown in the towel. For the rest, as the skies brightened, so did their spirits. I feel really good, actually. I could go for a while longer and I, the energy's up, it's still there. I thought I'd be dying by this point, but I got a second win, it seemed like we're done. You are looking forward to this? Oh yeah, awesome. For five more hours, they drove, ran, and supported each other knowing that only four of the original dozen would go on to represent the United States at the international trials in Turkey. When the judging was done, the four selected were 22-year-old Tom Davenport, an engineering student from the University of Vermont, 28-year-old Jonah Houston, a racing school manager from Monterey, California, 29-year-old Jim Sweat, a construction foreman from Lebanon, Connecticut, and 33-year-old Daphne Green, an outdoor adventure consultant from Ross, California, who became the first woman finalist in U.S. Camel Trophy history. And if you look at the end of it here, you'll see about... With the international selection trials less than six weeks away, the final four had to be familiarized with all critical components of their turbo diesel discoveries. They would be expected to perform routine maintenance as well as change a shock absorber or rebuild a differential and do it while lying on their back in steaming jungle mud. The learning curve is skyrocketing. Yeah, and that's, that's a wonderful thing. And I think especially, you know, as we get older in life, sometimes you can become complacent. When you're winching, you don't need to be moving the front wheels all over. It's not accomplishing a lot. You don't want your tires spinning a lot because that just digs you deeper down. Under the watchful eye of Tom Collins and his Camel Trophy veterans, 
The four were taught more of the skills they would need, ropes and knots, first aid, mechanical repairs, orienteering, navigation, winching, and the finer points of four-wheel driving that would serve to preserve the vehicle and protect its occupants on their trek through the jungle. I felt that they had to be a good driver. That was very important. And the things that they could learn, they could learn about the uh, map of the compass and their orienteering. They could learn navigational things. We could teach them about using knots and lashings and building bridges. We could teach them those things. But we didn't have enough time to really take somebody who couldn't drive that well and bring them up to the level we needed. And fortunately, we had some excellent drivers. What qualities was Tom looking for in his ultimate Camel Trophy team? Well, that they can communicate well together, that one can talk to the other and he understands uh, that there's not a lot of wasted uh, talk, there's not a lot of wasted motion, they understand each other very well. Uh, a good team gets to the point where one team member knows what the other team member is going to do. That uh, they don't compete against each other, there's no animosity between the two of them, and that they're just compatible because not all personalities can be locked into a small car for 18 days and survive. The people who have participated in Camel Trophy share a unique life experience that leads to personal growth. What are you waiting for? Let's go! <laughs> go, 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 go. You begin to learn things about yourself and you begin to learn how to overcome, you know, doubts you have about your own abilities. You know, there's three other people out there and, and uh, they're struggling just as hard as you are, so you just bear down and you keep going. For Daphne Green, there was extra pressure to perform. Yeah, I, I feel a certain responsibility. I feel very proud and, and honored. Um, so in that sense, I want to make sure that women are well represented um, and sort of paving the way to let women know that this is a wonderful adventure and that there's an opportunity for them as well to think about entering in the years to come. At the same time, we're all part of the U.S. team. Wheels this way, okay? Just a touch. Finally, the long hours of training came to an end, and the four finalists were as ready as they would ever be to join 76 other candidates from around the world in their quest for adventure. Get on top. Istanbul, Turkey, a long way from Colorado. An old agricultural research center has been converted to the International Selection Headquarters for the Camel Trophy Adventure. 80 finalists from 20 nations nervously await their first tests that would continue for the next 48 hours. The tasks have been prepared by former Camel Trophy participants and staff members who are experts in the art of rope and suspension bridge building, orienteering, first aid, four-wheel drive techniques, and more. Each of the Americans was competing to be one of the two U.S. team members. The constant calls of reassurance and emotional support showed what a close-knit group the four Americans had become. In the back of their minds, they were troubled that only two would continue after the trials were over. Orienteering is the ability to look at a topographical map and determine the best way to reach widely spaced checkpoints. It's not as simple as following a straight line, since there may be trees, a rocky gorge, or a mountain in the way. The object was for each candidate to pass over a log and tire barrier, traverse a rope, and retrieve a bucket of water through another tire. Got it up there? Think the problem through before committing to action. Make a plan. Communicate the plan to your teammates. Determine each individual's role. Make the assignments and do it all safely. How are you going to get to the other side? 
Here, after 45 minutes of trying to transport 50-gallon barrels and bundles of logs across an overhead rope, they were told by training master Richard Barr that they hadn't listened closely enough to the original instructions. In fact, they only needed to transport themselves across the overhead rope and then drag the equipment across the ground, a task that would have only taken 10 minutes. Mud, the hallmark of the camel trophy. If you're averse to having mud under your fingernails, in your hair, and cake to your clothes, you shouldn't apply. Foot-deep ooze could only be traversed using sand ladders and winches. These exercises showed that not only could the Americans do it, they could do it well. We've, we got, have two, we've got two, two short straps. straps. The, strap. yeah. the short strap is perfect. Yeah. Yeah, the long yeah. strap is for the anchor. Yes. Yeah. The Americans soon put their prowess with shears lashings to good use as they teamed up with the poles to transport 55-gallon drums of water across a chasm using winch cables supported by tripods they'd built. Camel Trophy skills build a sense of confidence that you can master almost any situation. Those skills also build blisters from pulling, twisting, and tying endless ropes to build bridges, slings, and tripods. Getting the knots correct could spell the difference between crossing a gorge safely or plummeting to the bottom. With darkness came the first task where all 80 competitors were brought together with a common goal, recover two disabled vehicles up a long mountain slope. Out of the chaos came a valuable lesson that they had to learn before they were stranded in the jungle somewhere. Get organized, get a plan, and communicate it. There was one last task before the final choices would be made. The 80 competitors were split up so they could race each other to the finish. And what a finish! The discoveries had to be secured and hoisted off the ground. Would they balance the vehicles correctly? Would they allow for suspension travel? Would the shears lashings hold? Or were the competitors so bone weary after two days of non-stop action that they simply wouldn't have the strength to get the Land Rovers off the ground? In the end, the Americans were part of the winning team. Time to clean up, pack belongings, and pose for a group photo. Then came the moment everyone was waiting for, the announcement who would represent their country in Camel Trophy. To represent the USA, Jim Sweat and Daphne Green. Oh, I'm incredibly proud and excited. Um, proud to represent my country. Um, excited for myself as an individual to have made it this far um, and looking forward to an incredible adventure. I thought that the adventure might end here and now it keeps going. I was simply focusing on this event and now I uh, need to start focusing on the main event. It's a dream come true. Of course, I, I knew I'd, I'd make it just because you have to have that confidence in order to be here, I think. But. Um, it's just phenomenal. And I feel really, really low for my two teammates because you know, we're family now as far as I'm concerned. It's tough. For Jonah Houston and Tom Davenport, Camel Trophy was over. But they'll carry with them valuable lessons that will help them in their jobs and personal lives. With training complete for Mundo Maya 95, Daphne and Jim returned home to get physically fit for the trip to Central America. Let's take a break now and take a look at some adventures that are more attainable by us mere mortals. The only qualification, you have to own a Land Rover. I read the manual, and what the manual told me the car would do, I didn't believe. <laughs> so I had to come here and learn exactly what goes on, and it's been good. As these Land Rover owners will testify, there is a difference between merely reading what your Land Rover can do and experiencing its legendary capabilities. For several years now, we've offered the opportunity to learn all about their vehicles at the Land Rover Driving Academy in the beautiful Rocky Mountains of Colorado. In 1995, we changed the format a bit and invited owners to come along on a Land Rover experience, mixing driving instruction with Land Rover lifestyle, amongst a variety of inspiring backdrops. 
Every session featured intensive training, beginning with basic maneuvers and quickly progressing to advanced off-road technique. Own a Discovery but like to try a Defender 90? Here's your chance. Or how about a Range Rover? Our staff is headed by U.S. Camel Trophy Coordinator, Tom Collins. His team of off-road instructors has many years of experience behind the wheel of Land Rovers. They really know their stuff and understand what these vehicles can do. I think it's about stretching your limits and uh, um, learning to do something that you've never thought of doing before and learning what uh, a very special vehicle can do. That'll start for the first day. You know, and tomorrow we get into advanced stretching exercises. <laughs> Letting the child out. Think backing up is easy? Well, imagine there are boulders on either side and a cliff behind you. This exercise teaches awareness of all four corners of the vehicle and the vehicle's turning circle. Later, you learn proper gear selection for climbs and descents. How to be smooth and steady with the throttle and the brake. How to use a winch. And, just in case, how to recover without one. Getting the feel for the anti-lock braking system. It's all about gaining confidence. Well, the, the adrenaline really gets to you when you're on that first edge. It's kind of like if you're doing any skiing, it's a similar feeling, almost identical, where you uh, you, you just, you literally almost can't see down the hill because of the angle of the vehicle. And it's that first drop over the top that uh, all of a sudden you say, hey, wait, can I really do this? <laughs> and, then, uh, and then once you make it over and you've, you've committed and then you learn to, you start to feel the engine and the combination of the engine and the slight braking and, uh, and you say, okay, I think I can, I think I can make this. A sense of accomplishment, something I never would have attempted uh, yesterday, even yesterday morning. So uh, that's, it's a good feeling to have that confidence to be able to handle a hill like that. Remember we mentioned lifestyle? Our owners also spent some time relaxing and learning from more experts. Good. This is the beaver kill in upstate New York, where fly fishing began in America. And these folks relaxed in California's Carmel Valley on the Pacific Coast. But there was one more stop for the Land Rover experience in 1995, the Cotswolds in the heart of England. It took a week to fit in all the activities planned for our guests. First, some instruction from the factory's off-road experts at the Land Rover driving experience. This course on the factory grounds at Solihull is used year-round to teach driving fundamentals and demonstrate just how capable Land Rovers really are. Enthusiasts from all over the world come here to drive the world's best 4x4s by far. Everyone also gets a factory tour to see the new state-of-the-art Range Rover assembly line. For advanced off-road driving, our owners journey to East North Castle, where Land Rover's good friend, Major Ben Harvey Bathurst, serves tea before setting off on the grounds to test the tracks where the SAS and Camel Trophy teams train. The predictable English weather just adds to the challenge. Afterwards, one of the highlights of the trip, lunch with the Major and his wife. But that's not all. There were tours of Warwick Castle, Shakespearean plays at Stratford, theater in London, and a trip to the home of Winston Churchill and the Dukes of Marlborough, Blenheim Palace. For 1996, Land Rover is planning trips on Colorado's Great Divide and the Moab, Utah region. If you're interested, please call Land Rover Adventure Outfitters at 1-800 726-5655, extension 13. Coming up, another Land Rover event. Yeah. 
I know what it's going to take. I know how much it will hurt. I know how um, awful it is at 3 a.m. At 6, the light is flat. And it's like a white sheet thrown in front of your eyes at 70, 80 miles an hour. I'm just very determined to make sure that I pace myself. You know, it's not like a World Cup race where it's over in two minutes. Three, two, one. This is the world's toughest ski race, the Land Rover 24 Hours of Aspen. There is no other ski race like it. The race begins at noon on Monday and ends at noon on Tuesday. Skiers must race as a team. Entry is by invitation only to an elite group of athletes, both men and women. The winner is determined by who has made the most laps in the fastest time over a two and a half mile course where speeds can reach over 80 miles an hour. This year, teams from North and South America and Europe accepted the challenge. 250,000 vertical feet of skiing or close to 80 runs down Aspen Mountain with the only chance to rest on the gondola on the way back up. Despite the mental and physical demands of the long haul, racers manage to stay in good spirits. British racer Martin Bell seems to know what it takes to go the distance. Very much like a Land Rover, yes. Um, we typify the same British qualities, uh, rugged and uh, long-lasting. <laughs> During the race, we asked U.S. ski champion Andy Mill to explain the course. Now what we're seeing is the top of this 24-hour run. What you're seeing here are the athletes trying to generate speed. This is the Aspen women's team. Skating and pulling, it doesn't look like it's that difficult, but let's not forget that over a period of 24 hours, these athletes will consume over 20,000 calories. At the end of the top flat, the skis will enter Dipsy Doodle with the speeds increased to about 60, 65 miles per hour. Pump house consists of two monster rollers where they catch good air off the second one. Again, the speeds are about 70 miles per hour. If this course rears its ugly head, it could be here in Spire Gulch where the skiers will ski really in excess of 85 miles an hour. Just listen to the sound. Cleaning this corner is another issue. I mean, this is just a mind-boggling left-hand turn. The legs get rubbery over the course of 24 hours. You're really fatigued. For one left-hand turn, everybody takes the same line, so you get incredible chatter marks in there. That right leg just gets absolutely beat up. Over 600 enthusiastic volunteers support the racers, while spectators come out to cheer them through the long winter night. There is no prize money. This gigantic effort is a fundraiser. More than $130,000 is raised through charitable events to benefit two children's groups. The Aspen Supports Kids program, which helps children in the Roaring Fork Valley to enjoy winter sports, and the Kids Stuff Foundation. This special program was founded by tennis great Andrea Yeager for youngsters with life-threatening medical conditions. So often they're told no, they can't go to dances or have a normal childhood because of their illness. And all of a sudden someone says, hey, you know, come out to Aspen. It's therapeutic. They get up on top of the mountain and we've had children that have come on the gondola, gotten to the top and just raised their arms in victory saying, you know, I've done it. I've done something in my life. Right from the start, the Austrian team took the lead and paced the nine others throughout the race. Over the 24 hours, the Swiss and the defending champions from Aspen fought a close battle for second place. In the end, the powerhouse Austrians were the winners. Alex Naglich and Christopher Reindl, both 27 years old and from Kitzbühel, skied 79 laps, racking up 258,093 vertical feet. The Aspen men's team of Nate Bryan and Tyler Williams had to settle for second this year, and the Swiss finished third. Next year, Land Rover continues its commitment to the most brutal ski race on the globe. See you again in Aspen. Once you've been in Camel Trophy, you become a member of a very exclusive club of young men and one woman. But you're only allowed to compete once. So we use Camel Trophy veterans to come back and help us with our selection trials and to train new competitors. With me are Jim Sweat and Daphne Green from Mundo Maya 95. And Daphne, do you think you guys were well prepared for the event when you went down to Belize? 
Oh, very definitely. I think we were very well prepared. Um, the U.S. has a reputation of building a strong team every year, and I think this year was no exception. Jim, you take a lot of pride in the car. What was your strategy in its preparation? Our big task was to keep a very light vehicle. We were throwing away food at the last minute, and we wanted a rear view uh, within you know a day or two, and we had it within two days of uh, the convoy, which was you know uh, pretty unique. We were the only vehicle that had that, that's for sure. What is the key message that you want to convey to these candidates? Oh, I think that how necessary it is to work hard, um, but at the same time that they have an incredible opportunity before them. They have an opportunity to work with a family, as you talk about the Land Rover family and the Camel Trophy family, and they have that opportunity here within the United States, and then they have an opportunity, if they actually make the team, to go ahead and interact with the 20 nations from around the world. And that is a very rare, rare thing. Now let's go back with Daphne and Jim for this year's Olympics of four-wheel drive, Mundo Maya 95. Central America, home of the ancient Maya, a deadly and daunting place with rainforest and rivers alive with the most striking and deadly creatures known to man. A perfect location for the ultimate 4x4 adventure. Camel Trophy, the toughest driving adventure in the world. Two weeks and more than 1,000 miles on some of the Earth's most remote and toughest terrain. Since it brings together two-person amateur teams from 20 nations around the world in competition and camaraderie, the Camel Trophy has also been called the Olympics of four-wheel drive. More than one million people apply for one of the 80 seats in the Land Rover Discovery vehicles. It's one vehicle per nation, with each also carrying two journalists who will send the story of the adventure back home to countrymen who eagerly follow the exploits of their nation's team. The Camel Trophy is not a race or a rally. It is a test of human courage, endurance, and resourcefulness. The overall objective is to move the convoy of more than 35 vehicles through overgrown jungle trails or across arid, dusty highlands. During the convoy, the adventurers work together to build bridges, recover vehicles mired in mud, and support each other in a show of team spirit. At the beginning and end of the convoy, there are a series of scored special tasks in which the individual teams earn points that count toward one of the three trophies, one for the special tasks, one for team spirit, and the camel trophy itself, which is the combined score of tasks and spirit competition. In 1995, the camel trophy crossed the borders of five Central American nations that make up the ancient world of the Maya Indians, the Mundo Maya, the adventurers would learn of the mysterious civilization whose amazing skills enabled them to build vast cities in the jungle more than 2,000 years ago. The tiny nation of Belize in May radiates heat like a furnace. The mercury does not drop much below 100 degrees, even at night, and often tops 118 during the day. But as they say, it's not the heat, it's the humidity, 95 to 100 percent. For the first two days, the teams packed their vehicles with the food, clothing, and gear they would need for their two-week trek through the jungle. With the start only hours away, the long months of preparation gave way to anxious anticipation. My first impression would definitely be the heat. I mean, I expected it to be warm, but I mean, coming from a Nordic country like Denmark, this is really hot. Uh, the, the physical conditions will be very tough on you. Go! The name of the lake is Lamini, a word that means crocodile in the Mayan language. 
So the first special task appropriately had the teams diving for submerged carved wooden crocodiles. The real ones kept their distance on the far shores. The Americans excelled at the water sports, but they were sometimes teamed with less skilled nations, so their overall results in these tasks weren't always the best. That's the way it works. Sometimes a team works alone, sometimes with one, two, or three other nations, and sometimes they all pull together. The events are designed by former Camel Trophy competitors and by retired British military types. They think nothing of making the young adventurers haul logs on their shoulders for a couple of kilometers while trying to read a compass. The driving task was called Lamini Cross. It was sort of a demolition derby with rocks doing the damage as one team member led the way while the other tried to spot the best line. When night fell, there was no rest for the bone-weary competitors. 15-kilometer course, we've got about four hours to do it in. It's extremely humid, looks like there's a thunderstorm moving in from over there steadily. Um, we're just going to drink lots and not go too quickly. We make sure we make sure we finish it rather than end up um, not being able to move after two hours. It's terrible. When the sun had the day so hot you couldn't touch a metal surface, the teams had to recover a Land Rover from a 10-foot deep pit, then push it across a finish line. It was with great relief that one of the final tasks took them back to the lake for more underwater recovery before the last grueling test, a run through the jungle over and around Maya ruins looking for waypoints. Finally, with the first series of special tasks behind them, the 20 national teams and support vehicles began the thousand-mile journey around the Mundo Maya. The first night would be spent in Mexico, listening to the weird shriek of howler monkeys and trying to avoid being eaten alive by the onslaught of insects. The Americans were glad to get going. Yesterday, when we finally took off, that was, <laughs> it was, it was fabulous. I think everybody wanted to just get on the road and let's start. Um, so and I, it, as we go along, I think we'll be able to see and, and to be able to work with one another. It's, again, that's what Camel Trophy is all about. After 30 hours and 11 tasks at Lamini, the Polish team of Marek Klar and Wojciech Slobowiak have beaten the other 19 teams to a strong first place. But just behind them, the Greeks, South Africans, the newcomers from the Czech Republic, the French and the Americans have not lost sight of winning. One of the hallmarks of Camel Trophy is crossing a wide body of water. In this case, Lake Petanitsa, one of the last strongholds of the Maya. The teams were divided in two groups, and um, we had to uh, put all the cars over to the other side of the lake. And uh, we could use those uh, floating uh, rafts we have to pump up. And, uh, well, the thing was, who's doing this in the fastest time? We didn't know what was on the other side of the lake, so we went there first and see how we get all these cars through a swampy area to the to the other bank. And we didn't have enough material to do it uh, for ourselves. So we used each other material, make one good track to the other side. So we help each other. The speed of bringing the cars over, who depends who was winning or not. It was supposed to be a race. The conditions on this side of the shore are bad. There's too much mud. So we don't have enough, enough materials to make two ramps. So we're working as one big team and we get it on fine.
The Camel Trophy convoy is spared the tough mud slogging it usually encounters because the rainy season is late this year. So the teams spread out as they explore the Peten in Guatemala. They cross mountains where some of the world's best coffee is grown. Then pass through teeming Guatemala City, where many Maya descendants still live. And on south to rendezvous at the El Salvador border. The convoy stops to present a scientific research station to Monte Cristo National Park. It will be used to study life in the cloud forests of the region. And now to Honduras and the most elegant of the excavated Maya cities, Copan. Could the Maya have predicted the next rains to make the journey camel trophy tough again? Back into Guatemala. Then, a rocky path no motorized vehicle has ever followed, a road built 450 years ago by Cortez as he looked for the lost cities of gold. Very hard work, very, very difficult driving. More or less, we have had to dig our own roads here for the last, uh, I'll say, two kilometers. Uh, it's basically just a horse track, and we had to cut out the, uh, the road ourselves, simply widening, find rocks to put into the into the tracks, and yeah, basically build a road. That's that's hard work. Even with the trail cleared, the jungle swallows cars and their drivers whole. The discoveries are pushed to their limits in an effort to cross the Spanish track. We've had a, a really tough day today. Uh, doing quite a lot of driving through really tight mountain tracks. We've cleared it as best we can. It's still a very testing track, the, the vehicles coming through. But it's really gratifying work. It's, Really getting stuck into it, and it's a lot of fun. It really is a lot of fun. The locals bet against the convoy, but 12 hours and 12 kilometers later, they were through. After three weeks of circumnavigating Central America, deep in the jungle in Belize, the tracks turned to mire. We expected something like this all the time, but it was no raining, but now maybe there will be some mud and some winching and fighting with mud. We are looking forward to this. Before reaching the site of the final series of special tasks at Suwan Tanich in Belize, there was one more group challenge made all the more difficult by their weakened energy and resolve. Basically, we had to uh, build, a, build a raft, or we could if we wanted to, build a raft and transport a Land Rover spare wheel to a vehicle, then travel further down the river. 
with the raft that we made out of pelican cases and a sand ladder. Um, come back, pick the whale up, and uh, get back to the start finish area. Absolutely simple, but uh, pretty knackering as it turned out. We thought it was, um, it looked pretty easy. We didn't think it was going to cause too many problems, but it was a bit of a shock to the system when we actually got stuck into it. And it was really hard work, uh, mainly due to the, the, the floor of the river, trying to walk over boulders, etc. Uh, it made it very difficult indeed. The Brits and Canary Islanders are caught in the fast flowing current. In the end, it's the South Africans who beat the French to the finish. But there's more, the final nine special tasks. Well, this task we're given uh, a number of routes to drive of different or differing degrees of difficulty, um, each having a different point allocation. Um, some of them you can only drive through once, um, and there are two stones marking entry and exit points for each of the legs that you drive. Um, the rules say that you can only drive each one once each way, um, and the one way you can only go down one way. So basically one person's got to run ahead of the map and navigate um, and take the driver through the course um, as he sees best um, to try and gain the maximum number of points. Another 30 hours to improve their scores set three weeks ago back at Lamini. The temperature is 104 degrees. Tasks are harder. The emphasis is on driving. So, so we go in the canoe, you two set up over here. Set up over there. The most physical of the tasks is Stone Woman. Fitting because it is the translation of Shunan to Nietzsche. Two pairs of teams have to recover 400 pounds of Mayan stone from the bottom of the river Mopan. The tasks continue. The competition is relentless. Driving is now all about winning the special task award. The race for first is now between the South Africans, Greeks, Poles, and the newcomers from the Czech Republic. The final series of special tasks take their toll. One of the Swiss team cuts his leg. American Daphne Green sprains her ankle and is disqualified by the doctor. This morning, it was clearly evident that there was just no way that I could that I could use it. It just it's too swollen, it's too painful. There's ligament damage. It was incredibly difficult today to watch Jim perform all of the tasks. He performed one with Eric and then two by himself. Um, I think for me, at least, the the words helplessness um, and disappointment come to mind. It really was heartbreaking for me not to be able to communicate. And that's when I really realized how much Jim and I do communicate in a task because I found myself sitting on the sidelines wanting to scream to him, Jim, do this. But obviously, you can't do that. Stefano Bianconi, an Italian dentist, finds he is not as fit as he needs to be. His teammate, Matteo Pellin, keeps him going. It was difficult, you know, Matteo helped me a lot in all the, uh, the canoeing tasks. When I get tired, he pushed me and, come on, come on, Stefano. It was really, really nice and this was a part of the spirit of war. Uh, the problem is uh, always the same. Um, after two hours, I felt uh, without salts. And so, you know, also when I, I drink a lot, I had the possibility to recover. Hi, Stefano! And I get tired and tired and tired. 
this was a really big problem. But uh, now I know that Camel Trophy is going to the other side, not only vehicles, but more athletics. Mario continues with his journalist. As does American Jim Sweat, now teamed with photographer Eric Schlegel for the final series of special tasks. Then it was time for the final special task, the Mopan Crossing. Two discoveries have been disabled and placed on one side of the swift flowing Mopan. The 20 teams are split into two. The object, pull, push, and tug each discovery across the river, up a slight incline, and across the finish line. There was no predicting the current's effect. The first vehicle was mired when the second sank in behind it. At this point, true Camel Trophy spirit came into play. They helped us. Let's help them. Let's go. Come on, let's get the other car. Come on, guys. Everybody worked together, even the two teams. One team suddenly stopped and helped out the other team get the car out of the water because it was really hard pulling. So we all worked together very well, turning out quite fast. It was great, it was a great experience. All 40 people working together, it was good. At the finish line, they crossed exactly together, so there were no winner's points awarded. They all shared final scores. We're glad it's all over, but it's been tough. But on the other hand, it's, it's a shame it's all over because we're all going to be going back to our own countries. I don't know if we'll be seeing any more of us, of each other's, and I don't know, it's, it's sad in a way that it's all over. The Czech Republic has pulled off the near impossible, winning the special task award at their first attempt. South Africa isn't far behind, neck and neck with the Poles. The French take fourth and the Greeks fifth. Two other awards were anxiously awaited. Team Spirit, which is voted on by the teams themselves, this year went to the Russians. The overall winners of the Camel Trophy Mundo Maya 95 was the team from the Czech Republic, Zdenek Nemec and Marek Rechedo, a rare double win.